Hey, it's Dr. Jack, and I'm reading chapter six of uh, The Marvelous Land of Oz. And um, we left uh, Jack, Pump Jack Pumpkinhead and Tip and the Sawhorse um, uh, nine miles from the Emerald City. So we're charting chapter six. At daybreak, Tip was awakened by the pumpkin head. He rubbed the sleep from his eyes, bathed in a little brook, and then ate a portion of his bread and cheese. Having thus prepared for a new day, the boy said, Let us start at once. Nine miles is quite a distance, but we ought to reach the Emerald City by noon if no accidents happen. So the pumpkin head was again perched upon the back of the sawhorse, and the journey was resumed. Tip noticed that the purple tint of the grass and trees had now faded to a dull lavender, and before long this lavender appeared to take on a greenish tinge that gradually brightened as they drew nearer to the great city where the scarecrow ruled. The little party had traveled but a short two miles upon their way when the road of yellow brick was parted by a broad and swift river. Remember this river from the first book? Tip was puzzled how to cross over, but after a time he discovered a man in a ferry boat approaching from the other side of the stream. When the man reached the bank, Tip asked, Will you row us to the other side? Yes, if you have money, returned the ferryman, whose face looked cross and disagreeable. But I have no money, said Tip. None at all, inquired the man. None at all, answered the boy. Then I'll not break my back rowing you over, said the ferryman decidedly. What a nice man! remarked the pumpkin head smilingly. The ferryman stared at him but made no reply. Tip was trying to think, for it was a great disappointment to him to find his journey so suddenly brought to an end. I must certainly get to the Emerald City, he said to the boatman, but how can I cross the river if you do not take me? The man laughed, and it was not a nice laugh. That wooden horse will float, said he, and you can ride him across. As for the pumpkin-headed loon who accompanies you, let him sink or swim. It won't matter greatly which. Don't worry about me, said Jack, smiling pleasantly upon the crab ferryman. I'm sure I ought to float beautifully. Tip thought the experiment was worth making, and the sawhorse, who did not know what danger meant, offered no objections whatever. So the boy led it down into the water and climbed upon its back. Jack also waded in up to his knees and grasped the tail of the horse so that he might keep his pumpkin head above the water. Now, said Tip, instructing the sawhorse, if you wiggle your legs, you will probably swim, and if you swim, we shall probably reach the other side. The sawhorse at once began to wiggle its legs, which acted as oars, and moved the adventurers slowly across the river to the opposite side. So successful was the trip that presently they were climbing wet and dripping upon the grassy bank, Tip's trouser legs and shoes were thoroughly soaked, but the sawhorse had floated so perfectly that from his knees up, the boy was entirely dry. As for the pumpkin head, every stitch of his gorgeous clothing dripped with water. The sun will soon dry us, said Tip, and anyhow, we are safely across in spite of the ferryman and can continue our journey. I didn't mind swimming at all, remarked the horse. Nor did I, added Jack. They soon regained the road of yellow brick which proved to be a continuation of the road they had left on the other side, and then Tip once more mounted the pumpkin head upon the back of the sawhorse. If you ride fast, said he, the wind will help dry your clothing. I will hold to the horse's tail and run after you. In this way, we will all become dry in a very short time. Then the horse must step lively, said Jack. I'll do my best, returned the sawhorse cheerfully. Tip grasped the end of the branch that served as the tail to the sawhorse and called loudly, Get up! The horse started at a good pace, and Trip followed slightly behind. Then he decided he could go faster, so he shouted, Trot! Now the sawhorse remembered that this word was the command to go as fast as he could. So he began rocking along the road at a tremendous pace. And Tip had hard work running faster than he ever had before in his life to keep his feet. Soon he was out of breath, and although he wanted to call, Whoa! to the horse, he found he could not get the word out of his throat. 
Then the end of the tail was he was clutching, being nothing more than a dead branch, suddenly broke away, and the next minute the boy was rolling in the dust of the road, while the horse and its pumpkin-headed rider dashed on and quickly disappeared in the distance. By the time Tip had picked himself up and cleared the dust from his road, from his throat, so he could say, Whoa! There was no further need of saying it, for the horse was long since out of sight. So he did the only sensible thing he could do. He sat down and took a good rest, and afterward began walking along the road. Sometime I shall I will surely overtake them, he reflected, for the road will end at the gates of the Emerald City, and they can go no further than that. Meantime Jack was holding fast to the post, and the sawhorse was tearing along the road like a racer. Neither of them knew Tip was left behind, for the pumpkin head did not look around, and the sawhorse couldn't. As he rode, Jack noticed that the grass and trees had become a bright emerald green in color, so he guessed they were nearing the Emerald City, even before the tall spires and domes came into sight. At length, the high wall of green stone, studded thick with emeralds, loomed up before them, and fearing the sawhorse would not know enough to stop and might smash them both against the wall, Jack ventured to cry, Whoa! as loud as he could. So suddenly did the horse obey that it had not been for his post, Jack would have been pitched off head foremost and his beautiful face ruined. That was a fast ride, dear father, he exclaimed, and then hearing no reply, he turned around and discovered for the first time that Tip was not there. This apparent desertion puzzled the pumpkin head and made him uneasy. And while he was wondering what he had become of the boy and what he ought to do next, under such trying circumstances, the gateway in the green wall opened and a man came out. The man was shout, short and round, with a fat face that seemed remarkably good-natured. He was clothed all in green and wore a high, peaked green hat upon his head and green spectacles over his eyes. Bowing before the pumpkin head, he said, I am the guardian of the gates of the Emerald City. May I inquire who you are and what is your business? My name is Jack Pumpkinhead, returned the other smilingly, but as to my business, I haven't the least idea in the world. The guardian of the gates looked surprised and shook his head as if dissatisfied with the reply. What are you, a man or a pumpkin? he asked politely. Both, if you please, answered Jack. And this wooden horse, is it alive? questioned the guardian. The horse rolled one naughty eye upward and winked at Jack. Then it gave a prance and brought one leg down on the guardian's toes. Ouch! cried the man. I am sorry I asked that question, but the answer is most convincing. Have you any errand, sir, in the Emerald City? It seems to me that I have, replied the pumpkin head seriously, but I cannot think what it is. My father knows all about it, but he is not here. This is a strange affair, very strange, declared the guardian, but you seem harmless. Folks do not smile so delightfully when they mean mischief. As for that, said Jack, I cannot help my smile, for it is carved on my face with a jackknife. Well, come with me into my room, resumed the guardian, and I will see what can be done for you. So Jack rode the sawhorse through the gateway into a little room built into the wall. The guardian pulled a bell cord, and presently a very tall soldier, clothed in a green uniform, entered from the opposite door. This soldier, carrying a long green gun over his shoulder, and had lovely green whiskers that fell quite to his knees. The guardian at once addressed him, saying, "'Here is a strange gentleman who doesn't know why he has come to the Emerald City, or what he wants. Tell me, what shall we do with him?' The soldier with the green whiskers looked at Jack with much care and curiosity. Finally, he shook his head so positively that little waves rippled down his whiskers, and he said, I must take him to his majesty, the scarecrow. But what will his majesty do with him? Says the guardian of the gates. That is his majesty's business, returned the soldier. I have troubles enough of my own. All the outside troubles must be turned over to his majesty. So put the spectacles on this fellow, and I'll take him to the royal palace. So the guardian opened a big box of spectacles and tried to fit a pair to Jack's great round eyes. I haven't a pair in stock that will really cover those eyes up, said the little man with a sigh, and your head is so big I shall be obliged to tie the spectacles on. But why need I wear spectacles, asked Jack. It's the fashion here, said the soldier, and they will keep you from being blinded by the glitter and glare of the gorgeous Emerald City. Oh, exclaimed Jack, tie them on by all means. I don't wish to be blinded. Nor I, broke the sawhorse, so a pair of green spectacles was quickly fastened over the bulging knots that served it for eyes. Then the soldier with the green whiskers led them through the inner gate 
and they at once found themselves in the main street of the magnificent Emerald City. Sparkling green gems ornamented the fronts of the beautiful houses, and the towers and turrets were all faced with emeralds. Even the green marble pavement glittered with precious stones, and it was indeed a grand and marvelous sight to one who beheld it for the first time. However, the pumpkin head and the sawhorse, knowing nothing of wealth, wealth and beauty, paid little attention to the wonderful sights they saw through their green spectacles. They calmly followed after the green soldier and scarcely noticed the crowds of green people who stared at them in surprise. When a green dog ran out and barked at them, the sawhorse promptly kicked at it with its wooden leg and sent the little animal howling into one of the houses. But nothing more serious than this happened to interrupt their progress to the royal palace. The pumpkin head wanted to ride up the green marble steps and straight into the scarecrow's presence, but the soldier would not permit that. So Jack dismounted with much dis difficulty, and a servant led the sawhorse around to the rear, while the soldier with the green whiskers escorted the pumpkin head into the palace by the front entrance. The stranger was left in a handsomely furnished waiting room, while the soldier went in to announce him. It so happened that at this hour his majesty was at leisure, and greatly bored for want of something to do. So he ordered his visitor to be shown at once into his throne room. Jack felt no fear or embarrassment at meeting the ruler of this magnificent, magnificent city, for he was entirely ignorant of all worldly customs. But when he entered the room and saw for the first time his majesty, the scarecrow, seated upon his glittering throne, he stopped short in amazement. There's an entering the Emerald City. There's the soldier with the green whiskers. Looks like he might trip on those whiskers. That's our chapter for today. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>